we have an online form that the link is posted in the agenda, which is on the MSAD 60 homepage. Public input is designated for district residents, but we may grant non-residency opportunity to address the board. Statements concerning subject matter that falls under the law regarding executive sessions, for example, matters of office personnel, cannot be made during public input. These do include your full name and the town that you live in when uh, submitting statements. And we have already received um, a lot of questions and comments. So we are going to read them all after the presentation. We believe that the presentation is going to answer a lot of the questions, but we will still go through and read them all. So please continue to put them in, and we'll read them at the end of the meeting. Thank you. So we have the minutes of July 16th. motion to accept the minutes of the July 16th meeting. Um, can you, there is just one, just, just a typo. Um, it's not Ms. It's just not Ms. Newberg. And uh, you have to change that. It's the only thing in it. Um, and where was that? It's third paragraph after public input. Uh, would that change or make a motion to accept? Any comments? Any a second? I'll second it. Um, so, a roll call, Linda Corliss? Yes. Travis Dwyer? I, I abstain. I was not present. Okay. Uh, Stephanie Hagenbuch? Uh, I just finally can hear you guys. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, we're just um, accepting the minutes of the July 16th meeting, but I think you were not here for that. Okay, thank you. Please. Yes, I'm a yes. Um, Rebecca Hopper? Mm, is she on? I was on earlier. Rebecca? Okay. Lynn Manley? Yes. Nancy Newbert? Yes. Joanne Potter? Yes. Ms. Reba Schaefer? Yes. And Denise Mallet? Yes. All right. Um, so, Audra? Sure. Over to you. Thank you. <laughs> so, this evening we're going to run through our proposal for the review of the start well start of the school plan and the proposal is in draft form so we're going to go through that with you this evening answer any questions you have and then talk a little bit about the public input that we have in regards to the plan i just want to make sure that my voice volume is okay so if you're online could you just give me a thumbs up okay great thank you Kind of fitting that it's a, a little rainy and blustery <laughs> out because it's been quite an interesting ride since March. So I'm going to read through most of this just so that um, just to be clear with everything that's that's being reported on. On July 17th, Governor Mills issued guidelines to school districts for reopening schools in the fall. 
The guidelines are based on a three-tiered color-coded system to designate COVID-19 risk by county in the state of Maine. Here is the three-tiered system. Red, a categorization of red suggests that the county has a high risk of COVID-19 spread and that in-person instruction is not advisable. Yellow, categorization of yellow suggests that the county has an elevated risk of COVID-19 spread and that schools may consider hybrid instructional models as a way to reduce the number of people in schools and classrooms at any one time. Green, a categorization of green suggests that the county has a relatively low risk of COVID-19 spread and that schools may consider in-person instruction as long as they are able to implement the required health and safety measures. Schools in a green county may need to use hybrid instruction models if there is insufficient capacity or other factors such as facilities, staffing, geography, or transportation that may impact full the health and safety requirements. These are the six health and safety guidelines. Symptom screening at home before coming to school for all staff and students. Physical distancing and facilities. Masks and face coverings. Adults, including educators and staff, are required to wear a face mask or covering. Students age two and above are required to wear a mask or a face covering that covers their nose and mouth. Hand hygiene personal protective equipment, return to school after illness. Six staff members and students must use home isolation until they meet the criteria for returning to school. Before we developed our hybrid plan, we sat down as a team to come up with our guiding beliefs to drive our planning process. So these beliefs are that we put health and safety first build and maintain positive relationships with all students considering social and emotional health, trauma and loss, provide safe face-to-face -face instruction as much as possible, provide up-to-date, effective and open communication, make decisions consistently, sustainably and equitably in the following areas. Delivery of instruction, schedule, curriculum, continuing of, continuum of services to meet the diverse needs of our community, analyze data to determine growth and loss to support academic progress. So the MSAD plan, and I'll go through these pieces again, red. So red for us would be no in-person learning. All staff would be prepared to teach remotely. Yellow is the hybrid model, and that combines in-person learning with remote learning. Safety and health guidelines must be followed. Green is in-person learning only if all safety and health guidelines can be met. MS 8060 will likely be operating with a hybrid model for the start of the school year. Given the current safety and health guidelines, we cannot have every student, kindergarten through 12th grade, on campus at the same time. So again, this is our proposal. Elementary students, kindergarten through fifth grade, in person, 9.15 to 3.15, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, 9.15 to 12 o'clock on Wednesday. Lebanon Elementary and Hanson School will have kindergarten through fourth grade. North Berwick Elementary School will have kindergarten through third grade. Hussey School will have kindergarten through second grade. Knowlton School will have Berwick third and fourth grades. Noble Middle School, North Berwick fourth grade, and the district fifth grade. Noble Middle School and Noble High School students will be partially in person and partially remote. In person occurs at Noble High School from seven o'clock to two o'clock. Sixth and seventh grade will be in person Monday and Tuesday, remote Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Eighth grade will be in person Thursday and Friday, remote Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Ninth grade will be in person Thursday, remote Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. 10th grade will be in person Friday, remote Monday through Thursday. 11th and 12th grades will be in person Wednesday, remote Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. The Sanford Regional Technical Center students will attend in-person learning specific days and times. More information will be forthcoming. 
We wanted to talk a little bit about our teaching and learning practices during the remote and hybrid instructional models. We will provide high quality instruction focused on main learning standards, clear, set clear and reasonable expectations for students, provide timely and meaningful feedback on student work in progress. We will focus on high impact instructional strategies, focus on high impact tasks. The purpose of student work is clearly articulated and meaningful and focus on the connectedness and community building. These are some of our considerations and challenges. Transportation, due to safety guidelines for busing, we can transport 26 students at a time on one bus. This is a significantly no, lower number of students than we typically transport daily. There will be bus registration section for families to complete on our next survey. School nutrition, Students are required to adhere to the six foot distance while eating lunch. This will cause us to use other spaces in addition to cafeterias throughout all of the buildings during the lunch blocks. Employment. We're going to need to add some bus monitors, cafeteria monitors, custodians, and substitutes. There will be coverage issues. Supervision and administration shifts. <clears throat> there will be need to make, we will need to make some shifts in administration in order to address grade level transitions. So that is the formal plan. Any immediate questions? Okay. I'm going to ask um, Amy to speak now a little bit about, we had some questions come up about health and um, she did get some latest guidelines. So Amy, I don't know if you wanna start. There we go. Yes, so this flowchart comes from um, the DOE um, in partnership with the main CDC. And basically- Excuse me, Amy, can you talk a little louder? Okay. Thank you. So this flowchart um, originates from the main DOE and the main CDC and is basically meant to navigate if a student becomes unwell during the school day. Um, it first starts off um, asking the question if there's a school nurse available. Um, from there, it goes on to your nursing assessment. Um, and if COVID-like symptoms are present, um, and we will then isolate the student and call the parents to come pick up as soon as possible. Um, if there is not a school nurse present in the building, um, there will be a designated staff member to assist the student. Um, if and there's a flow, the flowchart goes on to talk about if it's an emergent situation, um, what to do to apply a mask and call 911 and the parent. Um, and if it's um, symptoms that are manageable that are COVID related, to again isolate the student, apply a mask, and to call the parent to come pick up as soon as possible. Thank you. Yes. Um, what if the child like has asthma or something and the doctor has said not a mask to use a shield or something else? Are we going to do that? Or? Um, I'm going to just rephrase the just phrase the question again. So the question is about if a student has ma asthma and is unable to wear a mask, are we going to have provisions for that? Okay, so as it stands right now, and like everything with this virus, that things change and guidelines are fluid. Um, as of right now, there are no medical exemptions being in um, for students. I, I believe that the CDC has somewhat instructed PCPs um, to be careful with um, writing for exemptions of masks, because the expectation will be that every student will wear one. Um, but even at the shield? Like there are other... Right, so if there is a case where a student or staff member cannot wear a mask for a medical reason, a face shield that extends below the chin and wraps around the ears um, could be an option. So I have a, a, not really a question because I keep asking it and I know there isn't an answer, but um, I still find it amazing that the state has not um, made any options available for testing in public schools. Do you know if there's an avenue to apply pressure on the state or if there's conversation around that? 
or is it just as of right now there is no um no congress i mean there might be at the higher levels but um in our main school nurse meetings there hasn't been any um any insight that that's down the road so I'm, this is Estrada. If I may ask, then, what about asymptomatic cases? How do we avoid a situation like what happened just this week in Indiana, where their very first day of school, four hours in, someone who did get a test got their results and they had the virus. A student had the virus on the first day of school and that hit, you know, four hours in on the very first day. And that's with testing. How are we going to be able to shield our students and our staff if we don't have access to even that much? Right. So there will be no way to tell if someone is asymptomatic and has it. Just as if we're out in the community and we're in the grocery store and people are walking around asymptomatic, we won't know. But in the grocery store, you're only there for a short time as opposed to a full day at school. Right. And coming into contact with far more, far more people. Um, all right. Thank you. So. Sorry, Travis. Go ahead. So, given the state giving us the green, classifying us right now in the green section what's the reasons for us having to go yellow can we spell that out uh for the people so they understand why we have to go yellow even though the state giving us green sure thank you so the question is could we clear spend some time clarifying why if the state is giving us a green why are we looking at a potential yellow or a hybrid model so i will refer back to the part that talks about the safety guidelines and in those safety guidelines we have to have physical distancing and we have to wear um, face masks or face coverings and the physical distancing is in a range between three and six feet which causes us to really um, look at the spaces that we have and some of our classrooms when you're looking at even um, not necessarily a six foot spacing difference but even as down to a four foot area for students we can only get about eight or nine students in some of those smaller rooms that we have in some of our schools so that has made us need to use multiple spaces for classrooms so even so uh, just addressing that again if you look back at this green the slide that shows the green we can be go back for in-person instruction as long as we're able to implement all the required health and safety measures in in that area and so we have social we have the distancing issue in all of our schools so even though we are green the elementary schools uh, have those those guidelines that we need to follow all of us do but in the elementary school that's kind of the trickle up effect and that's what's causing us to uh, need to use different spaces I have a question. As we, if we were to move forward with this and, um, you know, the fall progresses and, uh, you know, we all know that things can change quickly. So obviously if things got worse, the default would be to go remote to the red. What are, what, how are we going to assess down the road if things are improving enough to get more kids in the building even if it's not 100 percent or you know more kids an extra day sure. what um what are the types of things that we're going to be watching to be willing to make that decision so amy do you want to start with that part of the question or would you like me to start okay so basically what some of the indicators that we're going to be looking for and i'll step back and just say our goal in addition to the health and safety is getting our students back we know that that is so important and and we have plans to look at what are our illnesses look like, looking like how are our students participating in the social distancing how are things going in school are the face masks and face coverings being used um, very specifically and with the right intention 
are we able to have the, the, those those breaks of those mask breaks in um, throughout the day in all of the schools? So if all of that is going really well, and if our county continues to look really strong and consistent, we certainly are looking at how we can bring back, and I think it would be more, we're looking at the middle and high school students, of course. So how we're looking at how we can phase up or phase in more student time for our middle schoolers and our high schoolers. Can you talk a little bit about um, how we're going to work with special ed and um, other sort of uh, case by case situations? So the other things I'm thinking of are like classes that tend to have multiple grades in them, especially at the high school level and Excel um, and special ed, any, anything that's not sort of a cut and dry situation. Susan Macri, there she is. I am here, hi. Um, so we really do have a pretty good plan in place at this moment. We are working hard to reach out to every parent of students with special education needs, and we will make individual decisions based on each student's needs. And some of the things we need to consider is how they're going to be able to meet their goals. We also have to consider whether or not the service that they might be pulled into a different area for, um, whether or not the benefit of that service is going to outweigh, outweigh the risk of leaving their cohort. So those decisions will all be made individually um, with the IEP team. That said, obviously that's not likely to be done before school starts for all students. So we'll start with our neediest population and move our way um, through through each student. And Adina, I think you're on. Could you speak to Excel? Sure. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, so our teachers at the middle school and the high school are going to be following the same plans as those teachers of record at those schools. So they'll be able to work with the students in the same capacity that the students, the teachers will be working with students at the middle school and the high school. Um, at the elementary level, um, I'm in discussion with the elementary building principals right now uh, to ensure that our um, thoughts for our students and our, our staff are in line with those of the, um, the building as well. Um, so our, our plans sort of hinge on the plans of the elementary school. So we're still working out some of the details, um, but our numbers and our group in our groups tend to be smaller um, in general than those of the um, than what the classroom sizes would be anyway. So we're hoping that we're still gonna be able to meet with our students um, in, in the relatively same capacity that we've been meeting with them in the past. And if I could just pipe in again, we've talked to some parents who are not comfortable sending their children in to a classroom situation, um, but we'll work with those families if they want to try to get their students in for specific services. Thank you. Did, the, did we miss um, out? The only other one was just at the sort of middle and high school, what do we do with classes that are um, multiple grades in a class if they are kind of, if their day in is a specific day? Do you want Joe? Joe, are you on? Is Joe? Yes. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry, but I couldn't hear the question. The question. Um, just wondering what the what our plan is for um, high school, middle and high school classes. I guess mostly high school that are tend to have different um, grades of kids in the class. So if you know if ninth grade is in the building on a certain day, but they're enrolled in a class that has multiple grades of kids in it, how are those classes? Yeah, those those kids will only be attending those classes on the days that they're in uh, assigned to be in the building. So uh, some of those classes will be smaller groups. So they're not a mixed, if that's the question mark, the so mixed. they have an online? Not, not on the in-person days, no. They won't be mixed. Sorry, what was that? When they're in the building, uh, 
they will not be mixed classes uh, unless those students are assigned to be in the building on that day. So some days we have 10th and 11th in, those students would be in that elective course and the other students would not be in on that day. So, in other words, the courses will run and operate in full functionality. It's just that the teachers on certain days would derive the benefit of only having a subsection of their class representing the grade level that would be assigned to that particular day. So they would teach it again on a different day. They would. Yeah. So, uh, which is uh, the benefit, I guess, <laughs> in terms of having smaller class sizes. The drawback is that, you know, as a school that believes in heterogeneity and equity and equal access to courses by nature. Our classes are comprised of students from all backgrounds, abilities, and age groups. Um, so that's one of the more difficult logistical pieces of our model. Um, but given three days, 1,200 kiddos and five grade levels, um, it's the only way we can get them through. But in terms of course offerings for kids, I think the kids would really benefit from that. It's a little tough one. Thank you. Estrita here, I have another question. Um, there's a whole lot of staffing that needs to still be achieved, and that's not even counting any difficulties that arise as people start having to quarantine. I mean, if you have a student in your class who does seem to have symptoms and the student has to quarantine, chances are that the teacher is going to have to, and the teacher's aide might have to as well, not to mention some of the other students, depending on contact, of course. Um, how how realistic is it that we'll be able to find enough staffing levels to keep things going once we get the mix of students and staff together and we are dealing with potential spread? So we do have a couple of advertisements out. We typically don't advertise in papers. We typically use, um, you know, our online system, but we do have advertisements out in fosters and so we are getting some applications coming in that way i just i will this will give me a good opportunity to kind of go through this with you we did put out our staff survey uh this week well last week but it closed uh recently we are still hoping to hear from staff but we have 80 percent of our staff have responded as of this afternoon uh so that 600 we have 600 staff 481 staff responded and 91.9 percent .9 of them or 92 percent um have established yes as their uh, as the yes no for coming back we have about nine percent of our teaching staff that um, are going to have follow-up meetings just so we can talk about accommodations that they may need uh, as a follow-up so that's of this moment so we are hopeful uh, that we will be able to get um, the monitors that we need for the cafeteria and for transportation and some custodians to assist us with cleaning. But we're not opposed to having to look creatively outside and look at companies to help us, for example, with cleaning or something like that. Um, a lot of schools are, are you know, looking at, at increasing staff as well. So I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but um, we are hopeful that we're going to be able to cover that. Is there any merit to starting the semester as totally virtual to buy us time to get more staff and policies in place and to see how things are working out in neighboring districts and then switching to the more hybrid model? I think that that is definitely worth something that as a board that we can dis that you can discuss and if that's something that that is a piece that you want to do. I think there are two steps that I would want to clarify. The first step is that we would, um, we are asking at some point for a formal approval of the plan because the, the Department of Education needs a plan from every school district. And typically, or sometimes, they approve plans that we submit. At this point, they want our board to approve a plan and then we submit. So they don't need to approve our approved plan, but we do at some point need a plan approved by our board. How we then choose to move ahead in the fall is typically, is totally a discussion that you all can have and we can make that decision. But like I said, there's two prongs to this, the plan adoption 
And then what are we going to do with that? And that's very similar. Like if I look back right here at this red, it says in-person instruction is not advisable. Some school districts may say as a board and as a, a community, we're going to stay hybrid. It's because it's advisable. It's not, you know, so just the way that this wording is can be a little misleading. But if as a board, as a body, if you want to make a decision that we um, start, start promote and then see what's going on, as you said, Estrita, see what's happening in our community and giving us time to um, get hiring and other things like that, that's certainly something that can happen. Thank you. Just because you adopt the plan doesn't mean it has to be done right away. Okay. Thank you. Um, I've actually got something with the monitors. Um, I know that some of the monitors are going to have to be for the teachers because the teacher is going to have to be split between two classrooms. Somebody's going to be uh, needing to be with the kids while the teacher's instructing in the other room and switching back and forth. Um, you just said that you, you've put advertisements out and everything, but I was just thinking about this today of um, if, is there a way that we could pull maybe some people from universities doing their practicum or internships, people that are trying to be educators or maybe retired teachers? Um, I was just trying to think around that because I, I know how it is where a lot of times they still need the teacher. You can give them their instruction and they run with it, but boy, they need somebody and especially the younger ones. And I'm just trying to think of people who, who could really be helpful while the teacher's gone. It's not just like, a, oh, I'm looking at the paper, I'm doing what I can do, but people with the background where they could essentially be helping out with the teaching. Uh, have you guys looked into universities or anything like that around here? We have, and we will continue to do that. We have a good relationship with UNH, and we often post things um, on their pages for um, experience, you know, just different kind of experiences and what um, different students may be looking for. We do have some student interns here in, at the high school that we are looking at, and we'll talk to uh, Adina, who is our Excel director, who also works with UNH and with our administrators to see if we have some flexibility with some of our interns. We have heard that in the state of Maine, we are able to be a little more flexible with some of our student teachers, uh, but UNH is not Maine, so we're not sure how those requirements overlap uh, with us. Okay, thank we you. Are we certainly try to be creative as we possibly can when we are looking at hiring. Um, we try to beat down all the doors that we can and we try to think of neighbors, and people that we used to work with and maybe, you know, we try. So. And the problem is there's a lot of people that you got to get and I know it's not like you can hand pick, but it's just, you know, if we can have people with that background, boy, I think it would help the kids out a lot more and the teacher, the one who's running around back and forth between both. I think we agree with you, Stephanie. Linda. So you say you need additional staff for the class monitors for teachers' aides or whatever. Do you have an estimated number of people you need to hire before school starts? We don't quite yet because when we have our meetings with a common to talk about what accommodations they need, that will really guide us as to um, can they come in in some capacity and what does that look like, or are they should they not be in because of medical conditions? So. Okay, what about bus monitor non-educational staff members? Do you know how many of those you're going to need? Not, not, we have to talk to every single person who put no on the survey, even bus drivers, and we do have some bus monitors right now. Uh, so, yes. I don't know if Brenda is Brenda. Brenda Caravens, our director of transportation, was on, but I think we lost power. She lost power. It looks like she might be on. Brenda Cravens, are you on? I'm Hi, Brian. I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Did you hear the question? Hi. Do you know how many bus monitors we may need? Well, uh, earlier we had discussed putting what we could get on the uh, buses that might have the most difficult students who might have a hard time. Um, but if you wanted to put a bus monitor on every single bus, that would probably be about 40. Right. So you're, th we're, you're thinking we're prioritizing which buses to potentially put the monitors on? Correct. We already employ monitors for all of our special needs buses. 
So those, those students are already in place. Um, and I have hired one extra monitor uh, in anticipation of, a, of another run in Lebanon, but I don't know if that's going to be anything we can follow through with this year. So we have one. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll have to look for more monitors if we want them on every bus. But I think if we just prioritize the buses that have the, the challenging students that might need help with their masks, that we could be okay. All right, thank you. Nancy. Um, are, can, is there gonna be an option for families who, whether they are medical issues with their children or they just don't think their kids should go back to school, are they gonna have a remote learning option? I'm really glad you asked that question because we've got a couple in our public input that ask that same question. So, um, Sh Shannon, are you on? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, so Shannon Swiger is our Director of Teaching and Learning. Shannon, do you wanna to speak to this a little bit? Yep, so we're really kind of in the throes of developing this now, but any student who is gonna need that remote option, we will, depending on the number of students in that grade, put them in a grade-specific cohort or maybe a multi-grade cohort, and they will be assigned to a particular remote instructor. The curriculum will reflect the same main learning results. It'll be rooted in the, that student's particular grade level, um, demonstrate uh, expect, grade level expectations and those anchor standards that they are expected to master by the end of that grade. Um, the students will have a daily schedule, which will be a mix of some face-to-face -face interaction with that teacher and the other students in that cohort for community building and then some of that synchronous direct instruction, some of that student dialogue and collaboration. There'll also be some asynchronous learning experiences. Um, that teacher will be available for questions and to provide those students with um, timely and meaningful feedback in terms of their progress in demonstrating proficiency in those standards that the learning experiences um, that they are experiencing remotely are rooted in. Uh, the main DOE is also putting together some project-based modules that the remote instructors can take advantage of as well. So um, we're just kind of figuring out staffing now and figuring out the number of kiddos for each grade level. Thank you. So quick question, Travis. This might be a good time to ask this, to have Shannon discuss. What are we gonna make for changes when it comes to our remote learning for this year that we learned that didn't work or did work at the end of last year? How are we gonna make it a better process for right. our kids, typically for the high school kids where uh, some of them felt like there wasn't a whole lot of remote learning really going on? Are we gonna have them be a scheduled, you know, scheduled classes just like they're in school or are they gonna be a fair game to do what they want when they want? Yeah, now I'll speak a little bit to that and then I can have the high school address that as well. I think, you know, schools across the nation really. Yeah. Sorry, Shannon. I just want to do sort of a part two to Travis's question um, because one of the guiding beliefs that we have is to analyze data to determine growth and loss to support academic progress. So I want to second Travis's question, but also specifically ask what, like, what is the data that we're going to be looking at and how quickly are we going to be able to sort of catch those kids? Because I think that's uh, Travis's question is very important. Yes. So Shannon, I'm sorry I cut you off. Did you hear Denise's uh, part two of the question? Yes. Okay. Um, well, let me answer Travis's and then I'll get back to Denise's. Um, you know, I think schools across the country had an opportunity, not just Noble, but everywhere to reflect on what went well and what didn't during that emergency remote instruction. We have spent countless weeks this summer developing um, improvements district-wide, uh, district-wide consistency in terms of instructional expectations and student work expectations, and really thinking about best practice for online pedagogy, and really kind of how can we harness that student engagement piece. I'm gonna let the high school speak to um, their plans of, for improving that more kind of direct instruction. So I'll let Joe and Allie speak to that. But Denise, yeah, I think, um, 
we're all across the state thinking of assessment in a creative way because we also don't want to just immediately thrust our students into some formal assessments. Um, there will be ongoing um, formative assessments. We have our STAR assessment, and we definitely need to kind of identify the learning loss and really group our kiddos together in terms of targeting that in instruction. So that's work we're continuing to do, identify right now. Then I can address the, the high school piece, uh, maybe a little more clarity than the, the first go at last week's meeting. So what we've aimed to do is to increase both in terms of the logistical framework of our schedule, but also in how we communicate the expectation to students to be live and online in real time classes at certain parts throughout the day during the remote experience. That's something that is a change over our emergency version where it was much more fluid in the sense that work is posted at a specific time where we did not require students to be live at a computer at a specific time. So this model, this improved model for remote instruction that is uh, including both the yellow version and the red version, it requires to be live and online in courses um, at a 50% increase in time than previously before. If you are in AP courses, you have an additional expectation um, to be live and online as it pertains to those, to those courses as they specify in our schedule. Um, we also carved out more specific time for group instruction and one-on-one -on -one instruction between certain hours of the day. So it's much more uh, regimented while still allowing for some level of flexibility for students to self-pace um, work on project-based learning, which often happens um, away from the computer at certain parts throughout the day. So we think it's sort of the next step iteration or version. It's a little bit of the best of the world to the best of our ability. Can you also talk a little bit about the, the new quarter system? Sure. So in the attempt to um, minimize transitions of students throughout the course of the day, in an attempt to adhere to some of the guidelines or recommendations really around cohorting students, which is really hard at the high school given the volume of students, the grade levels, the number of courses, we knew we couldn't find a block which again, given the three days we have, five grade levels, 1,200 kids, it had worked out that we would have to do that unless something else shifted. So we are operating that for the whole first semester, students will only focus on their day one courses, normally a red block schedule day one, and the next day, day two with different classes. And that allows students to again focus on about half the number of courses that they would otherwise need to focus on at one time, which I think will help, um, again, if we're online, eight courses online is a lot. No one takes eight courses online, really. Um, and then, especially for going yellow, back into red, and back again, I think it'll help with those transitions too. Uh, but what that would mean is that semester-based courses, so with the high school, there's really two flavors of courses. There's a year-long course, and those are more simple under this model. And there are semester-based courses, and the semester-based courses would simply just have themselves at the quarter. Um, and so courses like senior project, for example, will meet with those advisors to really help those people figure out how to operate under that uh, altered timeline and model, and kids as well. Um, I don't want to get too far down the road on that, but we have built in some preliminary models for how to give senior project students and seniors specifically at least two additional days of after school support um, in a senior block model. I hope that answers. Okay. So um, I, I have another follow-up to that. Um, it, are the students going to have the ability to have those one-on-one -on -one time with their teachers if they need to, or you know, if they're struggling struggling on a topic, they can be able to you know catch up with their t teachers to to get help. Or in during these structured times that I heard we're going to be having, is there going to be lessons being taught, or are they just going to be opened up for discussions as needed in those classes you know, are the teachers going to be teaching these students during these set blocks of times for these kids i think there, there would be both travis so in in the live class for example um there would be 
the opportunity to chat it back and forth just much like you would in, in in-person instruction. So there'll be direct instruction from the teacher, the kids can presumably ask questions, um, and then outside of that quote-unquote quote, course block, there would be times throughout the rest of that day or week where teachers could follow up with their instructors for individual one-on-one -on -one support or additional group support as well under both the red and yellow model. Okay, so our goal, if I'm hearing this correctly, our goal is to really treat this remote learning this go around as much as we can, uh, like it was in an in-school setting, just going to be through the computers. I would say yes, within the realm of what is considered best practices for remote instruction. Correct. Yes. Yep. So it's an increase in direct instruction from the previous model. Yes. And I haven't seen the public input yet, but I'm guessing we're going to have some questions about sports. Are there, is there any information on athletics? Oh, okay. <laughs> So the question is about sports, and do we have any um, further information on sports? Is Aaron on? Aaron is not on. Joe, do you want to address this? Yeah, they've uh, the MPA has uh, made some recommendations about returning to sports, and they pushed the dates back multiple times. And I think the current date they're looking at is possibly um, 17th of August, which was the last date I heard. But uh, it's sort of unclear as to how many games would be played, if any, and by which sports. So they're trying to come up with numbers of events that would take place in the different uh, sports for the fall. Do you have I read on yes. in the newspaper. Sure. Um, I think they're going to go to six football games and 10 field hockey, soccer, and volleyball games in the short of the season. I am assuming. Also, just neighboring schools, but I don't, I just don't regular play. Like, those, right. numbers, those numbers are accurate. That's right. their recommendation right now. Thank you. Cool. I've got a question about the supplies and the, um, you know, like ster hand sterilizer, things like that. Is there going to be a steady supply or a reliable place? I know what we already have, you know, with the numbers and everything. I'm just wondering how easy is it going to be to continue getting that? Denise, do you want to start with that? Hi there. So, yes, yeah, so we have, um, again, we just received today all of the supplies we mentioned in previous meetings, the, the face shields, the gloves, the masks, all of those things. Um, I cannot speak to the hand sanitizer or the cleansers. Kevin, the director of facilities, is focusing on that. Um, but I, for example, I just texted during this meeting, I sent an email to our supplier in New York and asked him about child face shields. And he was back to me within five minutes as telling me he had plenty on hand and how many did I want. So I feel with our supplier that we've chosen, we have a very good responsive group. Um, we have already talked about, again, the, the supplies we've gotten were an estimate to get us through December. We're gonna take inventory very carefully as we go and in October, assess to see where we stand with our expected usage and what we actually have used and then try to make an additional purchase kind of for the rest of the year later in the fall so i feel good with where we're starting and i feel that we have a responsive vendor who who will help us get to where we need to be okay thank you can you share a little bit about the um i'm sure some people are interested to know the cost and i know a lot of that material is covered can you talk about how that's being for yes so um we we spent um in our estimate to get this ppe so again gowns gloves masks for t for staff and students um estimated to get us through december and it was approximately two hundred thousand dollars worth of ppe for that for that alone um we have um we are have received uh, the ability for two federal grants. The first is the CARES Act, which was announced earlier in the spring. Um, that provides the district with $440,000 to pay for 
um, any COVID related expenses. We have to submit an application to the state and let them know how we're going to use it and then we can use it for, toward that end. Um, in addition, we were notified in the last, goodness, couple weeks maybe, um, that we have additional funding um, called the CRF, Co Coronavirus Relief Fund, I believe. And um, that provided our district, it was money that was sent to the governor for her discretionary use, and she set aside money for K-12 education. And our share of that is two point, approximately $2.3, $2.4 million. So again, that can be used um, through December of 2020, and it has to be an expense that is COVID related basically. So that could be staff, that could be PPE, that could be any number of things. Again, we have to submit an application and let the state know how we're going to use it. Um, but those funds are available to us to help us pivot and make the most of what we have to do here. All right, I have a couple more questions, kind of two part. I'll take them both at the same time and let you guys answer them how you want. But first one is, can we explain why we're focusing in on K through five in school 4.5 days a week and then the six through 12 being um, kind of hybrid for most of the time. And then the second one is, what is our plan if uh, with kids that don't log in? The, the, you know, we had a lot of issues with some kids that never went online. What's our plan for those kids in our, you know, our plan of attack if we run into kids that just don't, don't log in and they seem to be uh, being dropped off? So I'm, I'm gonna go back to our guiding beliefs. And when we started with our guide, developing our guiding beliefs, we talked about the health and safety and that was our number one goal. But then we also talked about um, the providing face-to-face -face instruction as much as possible. And when our committees and our administrative team talked about what that looks like, we really focused on the K to five primarily because um, the, the remote instruction is a little different at that level and a little um, like a kindergartner, it, it's a little tougher uh, than it may be for somebody in an older grade. But also a lot of the research, including um, from the Department of Education has said really try to get in as much as you can your early, early grades, your early childhood grades. So we took that information and all schools are looking at this as well is uh, you know, when I'm sitting in, in the York County superintendents meetings, we're all talking about how can we get our elementary children in as much as we possibly can. So um, our plan really focused that as one of the primary pieces and we built up from there. Uh, the question about in attendance and logging in. I don't know if different um, grade level administrators want to speak to that or uh, we can just give an over, overriding piece. Does elementary want to talk about uh, plans or thoughts around that? So Patty Gilly's going to speak from Lebanon Elementary. I think that what we would plan to do is, is connect with those families to see how we can support them. And that can look a lot of different ways. Sometimes it's an internet problem because we work with that. Um, when we did our emergency remote learning. Um, it may be have someone that connects one-on-one -on -one with the student to get to log in and then we go from there. But I think it, it's all about reaching out to the families and working with them on an individual basis to try to support their child or children to be able to log in. Because I think what we found is there was a multitude of reasons of why certain kids couldn't log in and weren't able to. Um, so we kind of had to take that on an individual basis. But we would, I think, work with both, um, pursue that, that that child boy able to lock them. And middle school? Yeah, I think uh, I agree with Patty. First thing is find out do they need tech support? What support does the household need? And it's all about communication. So we, we talked about home visits, uh, you know, what the Chris Russo and the tech department, just accurate attendance records, just whatever it takes to make sure, like some of the things we had last March and April, like 
where are these students just doing whatever we need to do with home communication to get these students enrolled and engaged in our buildings. And it really is individualized, um, starting with contact and reaching out to the, to the house to see what, what is their situation. And as far as the high school is concerned, I agree with what, with what both the elementary and middle schools um, have said. And for us, the challenge is the 1,200 kids first identifying who is or is not showing up. And so we um, utilized last time a series of mechanisms to be able to do that. Our response to intervention process and meetings with teams as well as the building assets reduced risks model. Um, and then from there, I think what will help this go around is again setting that expectation that's here from the beginning that you be live and present if we are in a remote option at certain points throughout the day, um, coupled with what is most likely going to be a return to pre COVID grading practices. Hopefully, those two things combined. But with the clear mechanism to identify the students who aren't showing up, we'll be able to make greater progress. Um, we did utilize some form of home visits, although you know, those are tricky. Um, we also did implement the uh, assistance of um, our police departments when it became a health and safety issue. But we can't really um, have them go back on Johnny's door because he or she isn't doing their homework or, or logging on. Um, but we are using all the resources that we have available to us. We can identify those kids who are at risk and not showing up and then try to turn the course on that. And also having students in the building um, face to face because only once a week or twice a week will be helpful in establishing those contacts and tracking what students are doing. And uh, the last uh, semester of last year, I've never seen so many teachers focused on connecting with parents and students to find out where they are and how they're doing. So I think we'll continue to do that um, first semester this year. Can we talk, sorry. Was somebody else asking a question? No, go ahead, Stephanie. Oh, okay. Um, I, this is actually a question before I get into it because I don't know if tonight's the night to talk about that or if this is in two weeks coming up that we should be talking about this, but the specific plan for the days and the times and the grade levels, it, is that something to talk about tonight um yes that exactly or should i wait two weeks um for a comment and a suggestion this is you you definitely can make a comment and a suggestion we are listening to all feedback that we're during our public input and um we're, we're listening to all of it so we certainly okay. yeah i want to make sure i wasn't you know messing up the order of things if that was going to come in the future um i, I spent a lot of time thinking about the Wednesday 9.15 to noon time. And it's not, I don't think it's sitting right with me um, just for a few different things because um, 9.15, it's supposed to be the start time. It takes everybody a little bit of time to get into what they're doing. And then at the end of the day, it takes some time to get ready to leave, uh, to prepare, you know. So I start to look at, you take that away and now we've gone from two hours and 45 minutes closer to two hours and 15. And then I'm sure there's going to be a snack somewhere in between and a little bit of a break period. And then we're going down to two hours. Um, I, I wondered if that day, instead of, I, I almost think that it, they shouldn't go that day perhaps for the two hours worth of instruction, just because I'm thinking about the extra bus monitors, the extra monitors in the classrooms, everything like that. And I start to think at the end of it, is it worth it for the parents who kind of have to, it's an odd disjointed day and then the childcare after. And then also um, looking at it from a budget point of view of, you know, the, the gas and then all the extra monitors. I'm wondering if it's worth it for the two hours. It's kind of something I've been rolling over and over. And um, in my own mind, I said, well, maybe that day should be 100% remote learning just to get the lower grades uh, a little bit more used to using the computer and connecting where we might have to go that way anyway, or if we should just say maybe it's a good day, a mental health day for them, and then the custodians can do kind of like a deep clean right in the middle of the week. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there for to see what other people's opinions were, because like I said, for some reason, I keep coming back to that Wednesday thing, and it's just, it's bothering me thinking it feels like it's not enough, you know, the amount of time, or maybe send them the whole day. I'm not sure what the reasoning was for such a short day. I can start with the initial comment about why is it a shortened day. And I, 
the, our elementary teachers need to do some planning and they need to do planning with those that are uh, working with them in the classroom and they need to do across school district planning with the other teachers in their grade level and um, it's a tight schedule Monday through Friday so we um, built that time in so teachers were able to have time to plan um, and then we felt that just bringing the students in for more project-based learning, more social emotional focus on that day would be a nice kind of way to kind of have the middle of the week be for them. So that was the initial thinking about that. So it was trying to give a balance between the project-based, more project-based work, science-based work, things that you can make, you know, have ongoing, um, some of the content area work, as well as allowing staff and teachers time to catch their breath and do some longer term planning across the schools. Okay, so, so, so from based on that, it sounds like a full day wouldn't be an option then for kids to go in for the full day and probably not for the remote learning then. So if they, because if the teachers need that time, so then I guess my two cents would be either maybe throw an extra half an hour on to Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, or get rid of it entirely. And I'll just, I just want other people to go through the same process and kind of ponder out and, and just generally I'd be interested in hearing people's opinions, you know, in a couple of weeks or now, whatever the case may be, but that's, you know, I just had to throw it out. Sure. Thank you. Would that affect all the school number of school days for the kids? You know what I'm saying, and right. if we they right. aren't there that day, or if, they, right. if, if they're remote, 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 if they're remote, remote in yeah. campus, right. And we've talked about different ways to look at the the K five schedule, and we did talk about full days, and we talked about not having them go on Wednesday, um, and this is kind of where we landed as a nice blend to kind of keep the schedule and consistency for families, at least in the morning time. Um, parents have been used to having. Um, the late start or early release on Thursday. So it kind of keeps that um, model going a little bit so we can allow for staff. Our concern is also for our teachers and our staff to be able to have time to plan. And um, that's why we felt that Wednesday time from dismissal on made the most sense. Um, but I hear I hear the points that you're saying. Definitely. So what, could we if we did go to an all day off or you know, no student day for K through five on Wednesdays, we'll still make them like a teacher workshop day. Would we be allowed to do a teacher's workshop day every week and still have that count as a day of school or a week cap of how many teacher workshop days were allowed uh, for the amount of days in the whole school? If we built in a component of remote learning for part of that day, we could get it to count. Yeah, but would the teachers be able to do that remote learning if they're working on a teacher's workshop that aspect? If, if they weren't in, if the students had the day with no in-person, then in the morning they could do some remote work and in the afternoon the teachers could use that for planning. Michelle, Keniston, thank you. And we did throw around the idea of doing some skills and practice when we were kind of thinking that when that a day would be um, not in person for, for the younger grades. So that was one of the ideas that we had, uh, given the fact that we're gonna have some uh, technology that that might be an option on that day. Right, thank you. Well, we're on the subject of shortages. Um, I know we wanted, one thing I wanted to hear was feedback of the teachers thought of this plan after the meetings that went on last week and did we survey or do we have any feeling out there about what the teachers feel about this and maybe what suggestions we can have the building admins talk specifically about their meetings if that would help who wants mike you're nodding so you want to you're yeah, right here i think like all of us the the initial was just taking it all in here in the agency almost for the first time for a lot of our staff the middle school um, or for all of us so i think that was round one just really listening and then it sounds like all of it began with the safety of of the students and staff and their families in terms of 
multi generations in a household or what it might be. So I think most of us have documents with um, a lot of great questions about uh, about safety, about protocols, about what to do. Um, and so it's Tuesday. We wanted this really. Um, we shared with them on Friday. We are in um, just a communication world of meeting with a. Uh, elect, you know, could be our global, could be our sixth grade, could be our nurse, um, whoever we need to meet with to figure out how they, um, how they see themselves in this plan. So it's all about the safety of the students and making work in the classroom and, um, and a lot of unknowns. And I think we're slowly knocking off a few unknowns each day, uh, but sometimes the avalanche comes on us, so we have to be careful. But it's just the beginning of finding out. At least at the middle school, it seemed like they were good listeners, but then there were a lot of questions, mostly about safety of kids, protocols, uh, and teachers and their families. That was very similar at the high school, where we had a, a hour-long presentation about the plan, and uh, we had uh, quite a few questions, and we created a document where uh, teachers could continue to ask questions, get answers about um, what this is going to look like. And as Mike said, a lot of them are about uh, safety issues, but uh, we're able to answer the questions that we've been asked and uh, seem to go well. Um, so as, as far as Milton's meeting, I think there was that initial like, whoo, um, on Friday. And then yesterday and today, I've been meeting with groups of staff members and individual staff members and overwhelmingly, every teacher that I talked to was um, like, this is gonna be really challenging and we're gonna do it. Um, the, the kind of, I don't know, the K-5 mentality of, oh, oh yeah, that's gonna be hard, but here's what we're gonna do. Um, and some teachers have already come to me and solved problems that I thought were unsolvable. So I mean, just another, round of applause for the amazing staff that we have at Noble. And I would echo that in love when we had our staff meeting a smaller meeting this Friday morning. Again, it was kind of hearing all that information, taking it in and processing it. Um, a lot of staff members saying that they expected that there would be some of these things happening that they were they were relieved that we were bringing kids back. Um, but then those those questions about safety and some of it we're still working on the details. So we each two had a document and they put their questions in and we answered the ones that we can. Um, and, and we can continue the meetings this week. So we'll be meeting with more grade level teams um, tomorrow. We met with some of the specialists today. Um, and, and they see some of the silver lining in some of this that they're going to, um, for example, teach the same grade level for two weeks, and so they're, they're already brainstorming how they're going to do that and how they're going to make it work, and so it's been positive conversations so far. And Melissa Roberts, you're on, I think, correct? Yes, I am on. Okay. Hi. So, hi. So the meetings went well. Um, Again, it was an hour and a half or so um, talking about the plan and answering lots of questions, a lot of questions, um, a lot of things that some of us, we don't have those answers to yet. Um, so we're keeping track of questions. We're meeting again this week. We've met with some small groups. We have um, grade level meetings on Thursday scheduled to go through more questions. Um, so yeah, we're just meeting and answering questions the best that we can. Um, I think there's a lot of outside of the box thinking and a lot of people stepping up to ask other questions or support or volunteering to help in other ways, just so we can try to, like um, Mrs. Kennison said, just step up in that noble mentality of how can we help and what can we do to make this work. Thank you. And I think we have Jamie, are you on? I think she is, is she on? She, um, I don't think she is. I don't think she's on. She just typed a um, a comment that she wanted to make. Okay, so our our association president from the teachers association just has a comment to address that as well. So do you do you mind reading it or? Yeah, do you okay. It says the association is meeting with teachers on a regular basis. We have a good 
open-minded communication with admin and are encouraging staff to reach out to building level admin as appropriate. There are concerns, but teachers understand and are willing to do what they need to do to make this work. We appreciate the willingness of the admin to listen and prompt responses. So I think what we're hearing across the board is that we have a we have a dilemma, but that I think there's an understanding about how difficult this has been and that we've been very purposeful about what we've been planning and how we've been approaching this. And um, as everybody said, we have an amazing staff. We just do. And um, and it's coming out and it's showing. And um, it's not a surprise, but it's still nice to see. So. Um, and I can also speak to North Berwick. Um, you know, we had meetings with teachers on Friday, as did everyone else. And just to echo everyone, I feel like teachers are very much on board with what we have planned. Um, Mike and I have had conversations with ed techs and the specialists individually. Um, and again, it's a very much all hands on approach. Um, you know, definitely a lot of questions as far as like, you know, the safety of staff and students, but I feel like everyone has been incredibly supportive and moving forward. Mike and I have um, meetings scheduled to meet with individual grade levels to have conversations about what they need moving forward. Um, but again, everything has been super positive just to kind of echo what Audra has said and everyone else has said at the elementary level. So, um, you know, I just kind of want to put that out there as far as North Berwick as well. Thank you, Mark. I have a, a couple of sort of comment questions. Um, they're not related, but I'll, I'll just kind of list them. I assume that given that a lot more people are going to be driving kids, that um, you guys are looking at something altering drop-off pickup. And I don't know if you want to talk about that. And then my other question, sort of on the opposite end, um, are we are we looking at adding any services for juniors and seniors who are going through this very bizarre college and job search time that doesn't look like anything they've ever done before? Sure. Do we want to start with the high school with college? Joe, do you want to start on that? Uh, yeah, um, our guidance department will still be working with students individually on college playing and that sort of thing. Um, We've also talked about doing some extra things after school, regular school hours uh, for seniors in particular to make sure that those uh, kind of things are taken care of. Thank you. And then I think we've also talked, so I'm going to ask the next question, which was about arrival and dismissal times and about the amount of traffic and just how much increase that is. And I think that's a concern for all schools because we, we typically on a good day have 150 pickups or 150 drop-offs. So we've talked about, uh, you know, uh, staggered places, like if you're picking up in certain spots, like if you're a third grader, you might go to one spot, if you're a second grader, you go to another. We've talked about an app that is a dismissal app so that um, we can have that more streamlined. Uh, I don't know if each build, you know, the buildings want to talk a little bit about what they're thinking. I go real quick. Um, so for us, the biggest uh, piece for us to solve was kind of a preliminary model plan, which I won't explain to you as a lot, but it's around our morning time. So typically we have kids mill around the building for about 40 minutes before the bell. And so we have clearly that needed to look very um, different. So we designed mechanisms to prevent that, um, to allow kids to have a safe and secure place to be monitored with masks with the exception of the upper area, which would be controlled demasking and eating, and then returning to a supervised location um, for the bell for the staggered entry. The dismissal procedures for us um, will really depend on the bus lineup. Um, so we will collaborate with Brenda um, from transportation on what those um, the dismissal procedures could look like for us and then make sure that kids are uh, queued up to prevent the, the mass exodus, which if you've seen it, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and then to, to attempt to maintain some social distancing while they're boarding um, the buses or being um, picked up by, by some parents. The, the big question for us is how many um, more high school kids will be opting to be riding with the parents versus how many do we be driving themselves already. We're used to a bit of um, more self-transport, but obviously we'll be opting in that and um, make accommodations. Yeah, uh, for us, we 
we were averaging anywhere from about 80 to 120 drop-offs for a sixth and seventh, and that could double. I think it all starts with gathering the, the, the data and talking to our families and seeing what um, we learn in August and what the reality is in September, and then going from there, spaces, timing, um, and procedures that work for all families, and uh, Brendan's always been about collaborating with us. But it starts with finding out the numbers, and then doing what we need to do based on parking lot and extension doors and um, things like that. Um, but yeah, we've all been thinking about how to keep that um, efficient, depending on the numbers, and making it work for everyone who can still get to work and drop off their kiddos. Um, little, little pretzel that we to figure out. Uh, a big change on the elementary is that we're really going to be looking at how to dismiss kids from outside and not having those parents come in and sign. And that's where we're hoping to use the app because um, that can really back things up in many of our district lots. Um, and the other piece is looking, we really looked at those dismissal times and are extending that, that parent pickup time because we feel like we're going to have, well, we need to have a lot more pickups than we had before. Thank you. That's funny. I think we, we're working elementary K to five with Chris Russo to look at those apps and have some demos on his labs. Um, having looked at a couple, they would streamline the process. Um, so I was we could actually read about that and how they worked. So that the, and having multiple exits in one line. Um, so I think we can, we can solve that. Do we want to move on to the public input section, or are there more questions here? I've got, I've got a couple more. Okay, Travis. Um, I'm not gonna remember what they are now, though. The first one was the grades. Are we changing? Last year we went to this pass incomplete thing. Are we going back to the uh, formal grade setup for the for the classes and? Are they going to have effects on your participation for school uh, for our sports? Yes, we're going back to the previous uh, grading system. Yeah. And uh, eligibility will be uh, based on your grades. Okay. I have a question. Um, uh, the chain of safety, and I'm, I'm focusing largely on the safety is that's that's the well-being of the kids is the number one priority of the board and our responsibility um and much as with um, an expulsion hearing where we have to answer three questions about the individual student we sort of have to answer those same three questions with regard to the virus and its impact on our student body um and with the virus the chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And we definitely have uh, a portion of our community that does not believe this thing is real, that does not want to wear masks, that's resistant to the idea. And of course, kids do echo what they learn at home. What kind of practices can we put in place to ensure that those kids do um, adhere to the rules not just when they walk in the door, but throughout the day um, to help the teachers, help other staff maintain the distance, maintain the mask wearing, maintain the hand washing. Because all it takes is one kid who's having a, a bad day to whip off the mask and get in somebody else's face. And especially if they're coming from a home where safety procedures aren't being followed, um, they are already at higher risk and they're bringing that higher risk into the school building with them. I think where we have some nice um, fight here is where it says masks and face coverings are required for schools. And I think that that language was very intentional and it really does help us. The word required certainly helps us and we're going to need to develop um, some, pro some protocols around that as far as with our um, code of conduct and um, our policies. Has, has there been any thought given, I know you're thinking about 20 million things at once, but getting information to the families that makes, makes it more likely that everyone walking through the door is familiar with everything that's going to be expected and with the procedures? Sure. We've certainly talked about 
how that might look. We haven't rolled out anything per se because we're just at this this part right now. Yeah. So plan. But yes, certainly talking about, you know, uh, there's information about having your students at home start wearing masks more frequently or face coverings more frequently and increase the rate, um, having them take them off properly at home and put them back on. Just a lot of things to do at home, talking about social distancing and, and pieces like that, that will certainly um, be able to send out as public service announcements. Mm -hmm. But again, I wanna bring up that I'm, I'm very happy that the word required, that language is there. It definitely does give us some, um, a big piece there that we can work with. Okay, you thank you. At the beginning of the year, there always seems to be a nice pile of paperwork maybe right. it'll be electronic mm -hmm. this year but i mean we certainly have parents sign off on their um, right. things and you know at least that information you might have to sign that you understood that it's mandatory right um there are ways to do that yes so i remember one of my other questions this is probably directed towards michelle but with the plan of moving a district-wide fifth grade to the middle school, are we going to keep them separate by town, or are we going to integrate them together like they would be in 6 through 12? Do you want to take that, Michelle? I can start to take that All question. Right. Um, I think we've, we've looked at, at spaces in the middle school um, and have kind of come to the conclusion that it makes a lot of sense just for placement's sake and for teachers working together to put them by town in physically in the building. Um, we are really excited about having the opportunity for our teachers to work together across the district to do some of the things that we've never really been able to do before as far as working together on curriculum and such. Um, students are going to be separated by their cohort anyway. So um, the idea that we'll really be able to spend a lot of time with kids from even their own town at this point is a little bit um, unlikely. Uh, certainly we would love to build those relationships and we'll have to figure out how we can do it safely um, because they are gonna be all together the following year, hopefully. Um, but we'll just have to think about how that can be done safely um, keeping kids as close to intact cohorts as possible. Okay, I think we're gonna move on to public input. Jen, what's our number? We have 64. Okay. okay. So just, just to reiterate, we're, we're reading public input from residents of the district and we were looking for a first and last name um, and then just a reminder that there are certain issues that can't be discussed such as personnel matters um, and then so do you want to read them and then we'll just feel like if it's something that we think we've answered okay. or not we'll... right so so we'll go through every, every, we're going to go through every single question just to make sure and then as Denise said, that we, if we feel like it's already been answered, we will acknowledge that question and say that we've, we've answered it through the presentation. Is it okay if I mark a spot now that we've stopped for that way, or are we just going to keep accumulating? <laughs> because I just, I just really yeah. Oh, oh, um, we just got another one. <laughs> okay. Um, and I apologize if I do not, I mispronounce what he's being. I apologize. So Andrea Gould of Lebanon has a two-part question. Will the district be offering the SAT to rising seniors since they missed it in the spring? And the other part of that is who is responsible for enforcing rules like mask wearing? I think we're still waiting to hear the specifics from the College Board regarding the test administration. We've got some preliminary information um, regarding, for example, the option for multiple test states to be able to spread out students, but um, our school counselor is to join. 
um, is our test coordinator administrator, and as soon as we get more concrete information, we'll be sure to share that, as well as um, information regarding the PSA to use as well. Um, and then across the district, the administration will be supporting teachers and um, students adhering to the mask policy. Becca Brown of Berwick, is there an option for parents to keep their kids home and do a fully remote learning if we are not comfortable sending out children to school? If a student starts a hybrid but things change, can parents choose to move them to fully remote? And how are you breaking up the kids into COVID? I think we've addressed the question of remote learning. And that goes for if you start in hybrid and something comes up and you feel that you, and you need to move your child to remote, that's certainly going to be something that we can discuss and have as an option. The other question was how are we keeping them in cohorts? And at the elementary level, I believe they're making class lists. And so that would be their cohort, correct? Okay. And so similarly, up at the, up at the other middle school, high school levels, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I would say, like, inherently with high school cohorting is, is more difficult. Um, that was something that was stated in the state guide, but guidance acknowledging that. Um, at, we are lucky at the high school that we have a natural mechanism of that by, by teaming. And so, by continuing our teaming model, adhering to grade level day designations and the allocation of space in only certain areas, um, that is our attempt at piecing together mechanisms to get a more of a cohort model. Brian Tuf of Lebanon, this is in regards to K-4. Will the school district work with parents in regards to curriculum if parents decide sending their children back to school isn't in their child's best interest? Yes, that's fun, yes. Chanel Brown, North Berwick. Will students slash parents be able to opt out of the one day in person if they so choose and be allowed to do virtual? Is this a phased approach, or which are we using as a timeline or criteria? And also, Wednesday two-hour discussion, why not take two hours and spread out the other days, so 15 additional minutes for the other days longer? So that's a multi-step question. OK. Do you want to just read the first part again, please? Oh, sorry. Um, so will students? slash parents be able to opt out of the one day in person if they choose and be allowed to do virtual. Is this a phased approach and what are we using as a timeline or criteria? I think, I think that question has been answered through the, you know, essentially if you're opting out of the one day remote, presumably that would be a 9 to 12 student and you'd be opting for an at home model instruction. Um, and Andre, I think you spoke to that. In terms of the phase model, um, I, I can say it speaks to high school. Um, we're looking at if things drastically improve how we can get in certain populations to do more, um, but things would have to create more space for us to be able to do that safely. But sort of our next phase of the drawing board is what would our scale-up model look like? What are our limitations given? Um, we, what the limitations that we have, what can we do? So I, I feel like we're probably going to get a lot of questions on the, like, how are things going to change? Um, and my feeling as a board member is that I, I hope that when we make a vote, what we're voting on is obviously a plan that we need for now, but built into that, we all know is going, you know, we're going to have to be able to move that direction or that direction. So I feel like even if we don't know what that is right now, whatever plan we vote to adopt, I I hope has you know the language or flexibility in there that we are basically saying to the administration, we, you know, the ultimate goal being the kids are back in school, but that we will have to it will have to evolve in some way. Right? Yes. Christina Brown. Are we? Will there be a remote only option? How will remote be different than it was in the spring? How will children get the support they need if they choose to go remote? What happens if someone is positive in the district if we return back full time? 
how are we moving forward with the in-person teaching when so many teachers are unsure of the way they can adequately and safely teach? How will younger children be comforted when they are upset? How will guidelines be enforced? Have you considered a plan similar to summer work? Why can that work for our district? So let's start with Amy. Do you want to talk about the, um, the testing? It's the coming back. Was it coming back to school? Okay. So coming back to school, if there is if someone tests positive, um, the criteria right now for the CDC is 10 days after the symptoms first started. Um, no fever times 24 hours without the aid of Tylenol or ibuprofen and improvement of symptoms. Thank you. We talked, there's some remote pieces in there, so we talked about that. As far as other plans, I think what I would say to that is we were aware when we started our plans, we were aware of what other school districts were kind of talking about and looking about, looking at, but again, it goes to our guiding principles and our guiding beliefs and what we feel as a district, as uh, the, the administrators and the, the task force in our district and what we felt that made the most sense for us and our students based on our beliefs. Danielle Minuti, North Berwick. Um, will there be a partial option for K-5? In other words, can I send my daughter <coughs> two or three days instead of four and a half full days? Also, will the elementary classes be similar than normal and restricted so only those, say, 10 students are with each other and at no point with others? And she also agrees with getting rid of um, Wednesday for K-5 and only bring those students in for extra help. So she's asking about, is there a way to do a blended at the K-5 level? Is there a way to go in some and out some? That's the question. I think the hard part to answer that question is if you have a teacher assigned to that class because we're self-contained at the elementary level, then it's gonna be really hard for that teacher to and that expectation of offering remote is very difficult because she's, she or he is going to have a class of students. So that remote piece is gonna look very different. So it wouldn't be with that teacher. So that could cause some issues if you're looking at a two day with a remote with somebody else and then a two day with your teacher. I think that that's gonna be hard to manipulate. Donna Bolstridge of Berwick. Will the extra people hired to help on buses, et cetera, be able to have a completed background check slash fingerprints done before starting? And then she has a second part of her question. Um, so the children attending will come into their class and not go to specials. Can you explain how this will happen, say, if a second grade, a second grade class has art and the class is split due to students in the class? How is the teacher going to be in both classrooms at Okay, so the first part of that, that gives a good reminder that Brenda Craven said, that um, she clarified that it's not 40 uh, bus aides or bus monitors that we would need, it would be 24. And we already have some. So that, that is a big difference in numbers. We just want to have that down. And we, um, the, the background check is done with, upon hiring. And we would not put somebody in a position uh, with our students without that piece done. Uh, do you want to talk about the specials rotation? Sure. Um, so the special rotation at the elementary school, um, if the class is divided into two, um, one half of that class may have art while the other has music. So we're not asking a specialist to be in two places at once. Um, the other thing that we're doing along those same lines is um, if your child has art, your child would have art for two every day for two weeks limiting the amount of, of students that those teachers are exposed to every week um, so that they would be teaching just kind of the same five or six, however many sections, straight for two weeks. Um, Thank you. Um, Emily Cook, North Berwick. How do elementary schools plan to provide kids with quality opportunities for physical education? physical activity and free play, how has the school system implemented ideas from outside of 
outside the box life for outdoor education? Will children be free of masks and outside? Um, as far as physical education as a class, um, we will have our PE teachers rotating in talk about for two weeks at a time. They'll have the classroom taking them outside. All of our elementary schools have enough spaces outside that they can go out there. They won't need to wear their masks outside. And we've also started thinking out of the box of ways to create those outside spaces um, through purchasing large tents and, and you know, residents that are talking about all of that to create those spaces that they can go outside and take mass breaks or have social distance time out there for playing recess time. We also did build in recess, so they will get those opportunities. And I know even I was talking today to the elementary music teachers are thinking about how they can incorporate outside activities that are um, even movement based and play based. Emma Ryan from Berwick. Will seniors still have a prom? How will the one on one with students and teachers work slash the classroom guidelines? How will all of the students transition? from different classes, many students in hallway or the pod, vocational school programs, will they still take place? Okay, can you do the first one? Of course, will there still be prom? Um, that is going to be a wait and see. Most large scale gatherings at this point are looking pretty shaky, although I know there may be a glimmer of hope out there. Uh, we will try to make something special happen for all students who are in this, potentially some form of milestone. Um, the second part of that is how will the one on one with students and teachers work in yeah. classroom guidelines? Yes, yeah, so it depends on if we're in person or you know, remote, but on, under both of those schedules, there is specific time carved out for students to receive one on one instruction and support or attention from their, their teachers. And we'll be sure that teachers individually clarify their availability through the syllabus that they had at the beginning of the year, through Google Classrooms or, or on their. Um, websites. And then uh, how will transition transition? Yeah, so one of the good things is that the model we are going to have about 500 or so um, students in the building on any given day, given that decreased volume, that's going to help with the flow in terms of transitions. We've been working to identify uh, one directional walking areas versus two uh, bi directional walking areas, and those will be clearly. Um, we're going to do our best through educating students on how to uh, proceed to the right way from the beginning, um, which is why at the beginning we're going to hope to build this orientation um, processes for all grade levels, really, but in particular the younger ones, who are here to including Mike and his middle school students, so this is a very new uh, to them as well. Yeah, and, and I would just add, even with signage and um, tape in the hallway, but a lot of those procedures that were pretty simple and, and pretty, you know, students knew them like the back of their hand in the past, lining up to get lunch is going to need some direction and some help uh, of adults to make that go smoothly now. So those plans are already in motion. Okay, cool. Uh, so has sent us some preliminary information. I'm not sure if it's public. I don't think it's public yet. Okay, but they will have an opportunity to access the courses. I just can't say how yet, but for juniors and seniors essentially, um, when you look at them just having our Wednesday day, those participating in both, which is about a quarter of them, will have more than that, um, potentially substantially. Can I ask a question? Uh, I think it was on the last one. Would you guys consider for the middle and high schoolers, if they're not purchasing, well actually even if they are, but to be outside for lunch? We, we looked at uh, those areas. Um, I think that what our basic planning was is that we do not want the lunch space to be contingent upon a need to have kids outside, that it would operate in terms of bonus area. Um, obviously, inclement weather makes that a, a challenge. So uh, we certainly have discussed expanding into outdoor areas once we get kind of the regular process under control, yes. Frank Lebs, the Berwick. What does this mean for Title I pull-out students? Um, 
I think um, we're still waiting on some guidance from the state and we're in close conversations with districts around us and thinking of creative ways, whether that's that's done remotely or it's done through push-in at our elementary level because the students will be in. So that's something we're figuring out right now. Can I can tell us from Berwick, if there are virtual learning days, is it going to be the actual teacher interacting with students and teaching them? Or will it be like last year where it's watch a YouTube video and answer the question? I think, I think in high school we've, we've answered um, that piece by increasing the amount of direct instruction with the teacher balance with those um, more project-based learning experiences that happen away from the week. Um, this question is going to be, Heidi Carrier of North Berwick, what are the plans for virtual learning? Will there be live instruction offered to address student concerns and questions? Will teachers from the district be teaching the online courses? What are the plans for high school and middle school sports? If there is no in-person instruction, how will children be expected to attend practices assuming sports return? Right. right. Hillary Sanders of Berwick. So for a second grader in Hussey School, they would be there all five days and a short day Wednesday. Correct. Um, if, if somebody did not put their last name, they might be in the question. Are they in the district? Mm -hmm. Janie C. of Lebanon, how are you handling kids who come to school sick? Is it automatic two weeks quarantine, or how are you differentiating a cold, a cold as a cold and not COVID? Okay, so that <clears throat> is obviously going to be very hard for the school nurses um, to determine. Um, and I'll go back to how we typically practice our job um, is to keep kids in school, um, but this year it's going to look a lot different. We will be sending home a lot more kids than usual, um, depending on their symptoms, um, and then uh, follow up with their providers um, as their parents see fit. Um, and like I said before, if there is a positive case, we follow the CDC guidelines for home isolation and return to school. Jeremy Hassenbrock from Berwick. How are activities that create a high risk of transfer, such as gym, music, and then in parentheses, singing, or band going to be handled? And then there's another part of the question that says, please address the level of notification that will take place when a staff or student contracts COVID. How will parents be informed of the building, classroom, et cetera, where the infection has occurred so that parents can determine if they will send their child to school. Amy, do you want to take that part? Yes, so um, if we are alerted of a positive case, um, then the, the CDC will take over contact tracing and we'll assist in that by helping to identify other close contacts that may have been with that student um, in the classroom as far as um, students and teachers. And then the beginning part of that was the high contact with the music, the band. So actually there was another piece on that question was what is the level of, I guess, transparency or information disclosure? Um, well, there will be, um, you know, HIPAA will not be violated. Um, so then the next part of that question, sorry, was about uh, the high contact, like music. And so, Michelle, do you want to, I know you met with music today. Do you want to talk a little bit about? Um, I, I, to clarify, I only met with one music teacher. Oh, okay. Today. All right. Thank you. Do we want to talk about that at the middle school and high school levels? Yeah. Uh, it is about meeting with these, with these folks. And we started right away um, with our music, um, with band, and with chorus, with the guidelines and the restrictions. And it is, um, Keeping the bar, we want the students to be engaged and to enjoy the course. 
but we have to make sure we're following the guidelines. So what can we do? What's the on-campus expectation when you're on for uh, hybrid, and what can you do if you're remote? So for the middle school, that are meeting with all of our specials um, and, and seeing how to maintain the standards as best we can and being creative in terms of um, when you're on, you know, you're not blowing into the saxophone, but you could be talking to general ed or looking through those kind of videos, more teaching and how to meet with those folks to make sure the academic piece is still happening and then trying to put performance when you can. So at the middle school, it's now meeting with these people, looking at the standards and going from there, um, depending on where on campus we're all. Yeah. At the high school level, we have preliminarily met with both our music and band teachers. They have been following some of the studies um, throughout the summer regarding the risk of um, singing um, and that uh, really, you know, brass or wind instruments that, you know, include that. Um, and so we have We've done the work of adjusting the curriculum to prevent those performance-based um, pieces happening in schools or grouping that around, really focusing more on music theory or distance safe practice. Um, and then we have a meeting with our health PE folks on Thursday to discuss the necessary modifications to the curriculum for um, safety. I will say that right now for the elementary school, we're really focusing on phys ed being outside. Um, music too is looking up to be outside as much as possible um, and we're thinking that we're not going to be able to instruct brand new um, students in instruments at the fourth grade level like we usually do because at that point you do have to instruct them in how to make this clarinet make sounds and that takes breath and all of those things um, but we are looking at an option to do much like the junior high and high school for those fifth graders who've already put gone and and that maybe they can do some playing at home and then do uh, video that to their instructor to get some critiques in person but not, not be playing in person john Devereaux of north Berwick will be for and after care be offered we're working with the y care on before and after care Yes. Justin Petrick of Berwick, what is the plan for students who have relatives at home who are high-risk individuals and might elect to keep their students home for remote learning? Will the district offer a remote school option for those who feel uncomfortable or unsafe having their child in person at this time? And we did answer that question. Katie Mado of Lebanon, as an honorable student on my school, was really tough for me due to lack of structure. If we go back to school, do we have any plans for a more structured system? Yes, that was answered. Um, Caitlin Clark of Berwick, how often will this be reassessed? Are there thoughts on actual video instruction versus student self-learning? I'm, I'm thinking that how often is the plan to be assessed? And I think that that goes to what happens in the state. So every two weeks, the county, they're going to update the county colors or the county risk factors, and they'll let us know. So we may have to shift based on what we're hearing from the state. And what was the second part of that question? Um, are there thoughts on actual video instruction versus student self-learning? I think there are thoughts on that, right? Yeah, I think, that, I think that that's probably a question around the increase in instruction. I think, yes, it'll be a balanced approach, yes. Okay. Um, Kelly Smith of Berwick, I appreciate the thought and energy you have put into this proposal. I know that no matter what decision you make, you can't win. I appreciate all that you are doing, Kelly. Kenneth Allen of North Berwick, is it realistic to think that social distancing rules will be able to be enforced? If so, how? Thank you. We've talked a lot about, first of all, if you look at the classroom spaces, uh, the desks are positioned very intentionally. 
Uh, we were in the auditorium last week and uh, things have been intentionally placed like uh, tape on different things. Even in this room, we have things spaced out and chairs in certain spots. So we're being very intentional with that. We're looking at potentially doing at the lower levels some kind of hula hoops or natural kind of buffers for students so that they can learn what's their bubble, what's their space. I think um, what was said about the high school and the middle school as far as going one way, going another direction, the other way when you're passing through hallways, through all those pieces we have to uh, make sure that we're instructing on. Um, so we do have some visuals to go along with all of that. We do have plans. Kim Fuller of Berwick, with all the classroom moves, grade level moves to different schools, should we expect to see the schedule for 2020-21 school year? Should we not have to go fully remote? We are hopeful that this piece is temporary. However, a lot has to change within the guidelines in the CDC and in the in what's happening with diagnoses and contraction of COVID-19. So that's a hard question to answer right now, but this is our plan that we feel is really viable for, for the start of our school year. Kristen Rose of Berwick, um, I would like to know what if I choose not to send my child to school? So we did talk about the remote option. Laura Costello of Berwick, if you are doing primary, primary remote learning, what will be different from the spring? Will you have live teaching? Will there be structured class time? What support will be offered to students who need one-on-one -on -one help? Remote is not a learning style every student can adapt to. So we, we did address that, um, just how we revamped that, but uh, could the high school speak just a little bit more about that one-on-one -on -one piece yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, so I would say that after the morning portion, which are more of those, those live direct instruction classes, uh, we go into about an hour or so block of where the AP students will be with AP teachers. But current to that, um, there is a specific time during each remote day for one of the instruction. There's also time um, in the hybrid model when teachers are um, on site or off site and not with students directly where by appointment um, teachers can meet with students throughout the course of those days as well one of one. Um, you know, many teachers take it upon themselves, although we, we don't require this to work and meet with students well beyond what they're required to anyways, um, but we're really careful to make sure not to set that as an expectation, but there'll be plenty of opportunity for kids to meet with teachers well. Or case managers or specialists and interventionists as well. Thank you for special ed population. Linda Lynchelier of North Berwick. My son has asthma and him wearing a mask all day is not really a good thing for his lungs. How do you plan to assist high-risk kids while being in school with masks in all day? And if the students take their masks off due to having breathing issues, will Will they get in trouble? Will there be smaller class sizes or will they still pack 22 kids in a room? And the last of a parent wants to do 100% virtual learning, is that an option through the school? So it is an option through the school. Amy, do you want to speak again about um, asthma? Right, so as far as um, medical issues with students or staff, um, the inability to wear a mask for long periods of time. We've talked about the face shield and the requirements for extending below the chin and curving around the ears. Um, and of course, we talked about mask breaks being built in through the day to help with that as well. Um, Lindsay Helper of Moferra, will there be a more hybrid option for elementary students or will they or will it be only a choice between five days a week in person or the remote learning option? Will elementary students still be having regular numbers in each classroom, just in larger spaces? Lastly, given that the state of Maine has now had over 170 positive tests here in Maine from out-of-staters, how can we depend on accurate results here in Maine? 
they report their, these positive tests back to their home states. Testing here in Maine at the rapid site in York is booked through October, and many pediatricians are reporting a two-week lag week waiting for results. How will the lack of timely tests impact our students of MS86? Do we want to start with the health piece? Yeah, so I know that, you know, primary care offices are bracing for school to begin and what that's going to mean for the need to increase testing. Um, I know that they're planning for that. Um, okay, thank you. And, and I, I, I want to say at our elementary levels, we're all looking at smaller class sizes. So when you're thinking of a class of 22, that's not what our intent is at the elementary level. We talked a little bit about some of the shapes of our room, some of the sizes of our room. We aren't only allowing six, eight, nine, ten in a room. So you're, you're not looking at those huge 22 numbers as a typical part of K-5, correct? There are some rooms in the district that will hold 22 children. Um, but that's 22 children really appropriately spaced. And some of those rooms, you know, may have been art rooms or libraries or science labs. And so in those rooms, you may have a more typical group of students. Many of our rooms do not hold that many students um, and hold anywhere between 8 and 14. So it really is dependent on us meeting those social distance guidelines. Lydia Otash of Berwick, could we view the slides that have the per proposed schedules again, sorry, please. Do the power outage we logged in as the slides were being changed, thank you. I'll just keep those up and I'll switch them in a minute to move on. Marcy Sewell of Berwick, what kind of updates will the school be doing to the current ventilation system to properly reduce the aerosol droplet spread of COVID-19. Will there be air purifiers in every room and on the buses? Is Kevin on yet? He's not. Okay. He has lost power. Yes. So Kevin Moore, our head of facilities, did lose power. Uh, so what I can let us, what I can say is that today, uh, specialty was in talking with Kevin, or it was yesterday, um, and they were talking about each building and what needs to be up building uh, to handle that, to address that question, to address our, our concerns around air quality. So if it, an air purifier is needed because it's identified as being needed, one will be in there. Brenda Cravens, I don't know if you want to talk about the buses. If oh, she's on. Um, I do not see that. Okay. Um, I know the windows are going to be down in the buses, and we, we're going to have air circulating through the buses. Mark Chandler of North Berwick, will there, will there be set hours of instruction on the remote days, and what are your, what are your starting in-person instruction earlier than the regular instruction hours, despite all the studies showing a later start is beneficial to older students? So there will be specific times for instruction to begin. It's going to be consistent, and there will be a schedule that will be handed out for students. There is a lot of discussion about later start times for older students. However, we have the tech, to, um, the San Francisco Tech, um, that we needed to look at, um, the center that we needed to look at, and kind of build some parameters around that, and that had impact to the rest of our high school, middle school students, and that had a trickle down effect that time to our elementary. Maurice, I apologize, Vanda Hevel from Berwick. What exactly will the format for the high school online learning look like? Will teachers be teaching in real time in blocks of time as in a Zoom meeting? The prior model was not engaging enough and did not allow for teachers, students, discussion, and put too many responsibilities on children who may struggle with prioritizing and asking Additionally, what extra resources will be available for mental health issues from lack of social I think we addressed a lot of the question, the, the first part of that question. 
And so to talk about mental health kind of or health and wellness pieces, uh, we, we are committed to doing a lot of the social skills and the social development work that we've been doing at the elementary levels. Uh, I don't know, middle school and high school want to talk a little bit about what your plans are, but I know like we have second step at the elementary level. We have ongoing training and we have some ongoing training at the beginning of this year and also on some of our workshop days with our staff around uh, student health and wellness, uh, social emotional wellness and well-being. Yeah, I would agree with that. I'd say that's something we would be looking at doing is um, increasing our ability to implement iTimes, the social social learning pieces remotely. That was something that we weren't able to do under the emergency model. Um, so we're going to be working to implement those. And then secondarily, I think that we would be um, helping our school counselors um, communicate their availability to those expectations of availability um, across those staff to students um, in a remote model. It's, it can be a little tricky, um, but we're going to, at this second go, um, work a little more closely to support them around that. And I don't think it's been said tonight um, in terms of the middle school schedule. I think Elliot uh, phrased it as increasing the framework, but the middle school is following the, the high school approach when um, remote days would be specific times to be on and blocks to be followed, and not uh, more of a, a generic I think we're all concerned about that um, that attachment when we're remote. So I mean, it's been said. So six, seven, also is planning on those specific points of time where families and students can count on um, uh, routine or schedule. Thank you. It looks like the next few questions are kind of about we have some people I heard. Melanie Richardson of Berwick, will, will virtual learning be available for families that do not feel comfortable sending students to school? Should the district open schools? Melissa Jones of Lebanon, how will social distancing work? Last year, there were 22 kids in my daughter's second grade class. Um, Michelle Lanier of Berwick, are there plans in place for seniors to complete requirements for college admissions, such as SAT, after place or test, et cetera? I think we did address that one as well. Michelle MacGyver of Berwick, is there a plan for remote only for students who cannot return for medical reasons? Will there be remote only classes? What is the plan for those students? And then Michelle goes on to comment, I'm glad that you, you are having a remote option for medical students that are needed. I also like that you stated there, they will be in a remote only cohort and not assigned to a class that also has in-person instruction. My follow-up question is for those that have to go remote, what is the time period for choosing remote? Is it, is it for the whole year or only until January if the vaccine becomes available and they receive it, can they return to school or what is happening? We've talked a little bit about this as far as if, if somebody starts remote and circumstances change for them, they're certainly able to come into the school setting for if that's a hybrid, however that hybrid model looks for that grade level. Sam Texera of Lebanon, how will high school students be held accountable for daily attendance, work completion, and meeting due to dates for work submission as many students do not engage consistently in scheduled virtual meetings, reply to emails, or turn in work until the last week of school? Joe, do you want to address that? I think you're muted. No, you're right. Okay. We answered that question earlier, that uh, we will have the students uh, in person, remotely, um, not in person, but remotely uh, with our teachers. We'll take attendance uh, when they're in their uh, remote learning environment. And then on the days that they're in school, we obviously can take attendance on those days. So I think we have a pretty good way of doing attendance and holding those kids accountable. Thank you. Again, the return to pre-COVID grading this expectations for being present, I think, will help a lot. Um, I would say that the other thing to remember is that this is really hard for a lot of kids and a lot of families in so many ways. And it was under the emergency version of this, too. And a lot of that hasn't necessarily changed. So sometimes when students aren't showing up 
we're doing, we hope or expect there's good reasons behind that. So I think we just have to be careful to, to not assume it's always um, intentional. There's a balance to that too. Rachel Maslowski of Lebanon, if our students have to be vaccinated for many other diseases and show proof before attending our schools, why are we allowing in-person learning before a vaccine is available? Right, so the guidelines for the immunization requirements are drafted by the DOE, DHHS, and the CDC. And the timeline that that would be, I feel like for a, a vaccine to become available, safe, tested, and for then it to be added to the main law would be a significant amount of time from now. Um, and I know that's probably something everybody's thinking about, um, so I don't have a good answer to that. Um, those are just the many steps that it would have to go through to become a requirement. Regan. Truth of Lebanon, if parents are uncomfortable sending their children in with guidelines, will we have access to curriculum from the schools? Do you really think the younger grades are going to be able to follow these safety protocols without behavioral slash mental health issues? And I agree that maybe Wednesday could be a worksheet or a remote learning day. I'm having a hard time considering my second and fourth grade students getting much out of two and a half hour day. Um, Shannon Ferguson, what will be in place to ensure children who have IEPs continue to make progress and do not regress? Also, how can we assure that our children with IEPs do not get overwhelmed with schoolwork and bogged down with non-essential classes and make sure all accommodations are met for each individual student with an IEP? So so we will continue to assess students and take data. Um, one of the things that's very important to know is we suspect that there are a lot of our students who have regressed more than a typical student has regressed. And when, when it's appropriate, um, we will assess what their regression has been and then come up with a plan to address that. Did yeah. that answer the question? And there's a second part of that question is, if there is online learning, how are parents supposed to maintain dual incomes to support their families and for te teachers who have children themselves? How are they expected to teach their children and their students? Can you say that one again? I'm sorry. OK, no, that's OK. If there is online learning, how are how are parents supposed to maintain dual income to support their families and for children themselves, how are they expected to teach their children and their students? Well, I think that's a really good question. And we did certainly see challenges with that. We had a lot of, as our teachers have children at home and when we were fully remote in the spring, we had to have that balance between the teaching um, and then the teaching, the teachers teaching their own children. So we certainly had that. Um, we very much appreciate the challenges parents are facing with being in a family that where you have to find jobs. And then if we have to go remote, we understand that that adds another burden onto an already tight schedule. Um, so we're certainly hoping that we can build some good platforms and, and do some good work ahead of that. So if we do have to go fully remote, that we um, have a good routine and good processes in place for, for children to use. Shelby Henley of North Berwick, how will proper ventilation and alignment with the requirement of masks worn by staff and students be implemented in our schools? I think the first step is that we had somebody come in and walk through the building. They're giving us a report. We're going to implement the parts um, that we need to implement for school. Son Boy of North Berwick is a parent. The health and safety of our children is not a priority. Four and a half days in school during a pandemic with even more kids is asking for spread. Will there be full online option? Sue Pilgrim of Berwick. 
in the elementary level, how will schools deal with social distancing in the classroom? Will class sizes be smaller? Will the district be hiring more teachers? How will that change the budget? Okay, all that was addressed. Um, Sue Parsley of North Berwick, regarding the high school, will students be required to stay for the entire day or only attend their classes? Can they leave after their required classes? So that's a great question. So we've begun taking a look at, in particular, the older students who do transport um, about extending early release, late arrival privileges across both those grade levels. Typically, that's reserved for only seniors who meet specific criteria. Um, we're really looking at expanding that. Um, and if children at the younger grade levels have a parent come, and for example, they have an end of the day tutorial, um, we would certainly allow them for that without penalty. What would be tough is having open campus where we have a tutorial midday, the coming and then coming, going and coming back um, would not be something we would advocate for um, for a variety of, of reasons. But at the beginning of the day, end of the day, sure. Tanya Noyes of Berwick, why is the middle and high school the only ones who are truly hybrid schedule? Why can't we do the whole district two days in the building, Wednesday remote to clean the building, and then Thursday, Friday in the building for the entire district? Okay, we did address that. Thomas Schreit of Lebanon, will masks be required at all times or will desks be far enough apart that they will not need masks at their desks? We did address that. Wendy Hashem of Berwick, what kind of support will you be offering parents who choose to homeschool? Christine Hudden of North Berwick, if a child does not have a headache or fever, fever or other symptoms, are they going to have to stay home for two weeks, while siblings who are not having any symptoms be required to stay home, and what will be required for them to return? Okay, so we will be coming up with an uh, at-home self-screening tool for both students and staff um, to work through if your child has XYZ, then they shall stay home. Um, and then as far as um, siblings who are asymptomatic, the sibling would not have to stay at home um, if the sibling did not meet any of that criteria. And then, and then I think we already addressed um, the return to school um, protocol. Right. Becca Rao of Berwick, in the high school, will the classrooms be fully sanitized between grades using them? Yeah, we're working with uh, the custodial staff on the details of the cleaning procedures. Angela Gould of Berwick, why should the younger kids get more time than the high school? Shouldn't it be equal for all students to learn? I think we've addressed that. Wendy Hashem of Berwick, what kind of support will you offer in parents who choose to homeschool? Beth Hagel of Berwick, if a student is sent home with a fever but does not get a COVID task, will they have to stay out of school for two weeks? Um, that'll be dependent on um, if the student goes to their primary care provider and what guidance they are given there, if they should stay home and isolate or not. Brian Tu of Lebanon, I noticed the start time for middle and high school has been made 7 a.m. Is there a reason for an earlier start time? Here we address that. Kathleen Myers of Berwick, is the first day of school pushed out? What is the start date? We have not pushed out this, um, the start of school for students. We have to, um, we're doing this in phases. We wanted to present the plan tonight and then uh, we need to formally at some point look at the plan and at that point that will help us decide if we need to uh, bump the school day. I believe it was reported in the newspaper that a lot of um, parts of our county are bumping it to September 8th and that's certainly something that we are uh, going to consider. And this is the final comment. Vicki Johnson of North Berwick, thank you for the thought you put into this. Has there been talk about before and after care at North Berwick Elementary School? And how soon can we expect a final forward? Okay, good. So we have talked a little bit about, about Y care before and after school. Uh, we've met with the Y care um, providers to discuss their availability and their willingness to be in our buildings, which they have said that they're willing to be in our buildings. 
and then um, talking about the vote, I think that's a good question. I think that's the next, that leads us to um, kind of the next. I, I actually have one more question. Um, your point about not violating HIPAA, do we have to report like an aggregate if there are cases, obviously not individual information? Absolutely, yeah. So there is a list of communicable, communicable diseases pre-COVID that if we saw pop up in our schools, we would alert the CDC. And much like they're doing now with contact tracing, they would um, follow through in that respect as well. So does that become public? The way Maine is reporting it, would it be public that in a high school, the middle school, whatever it had? Um, I, it would depend on probably the numbers. I mean, from what I've been following with Dr. Shaw on his news briefs, he is very cautious about if there is a small outbreak at a certain facility about giving too much of that information so not to disclose, you know, who it potentially could be in a small community. So I feel like it would be reasonable to do that. It would be up to the state whether or not it was disclosed. Correct. Okay. So those are the, the questions. All right. I have a follow-up question, kind of does a, a positive note here is let's think if we think positive for a second we're going to reassess this uh, i think i heard you say something about maybe like a two week every two weeks when the state reassesses it every two weeks what is our plan for when if we do get to that point where this just happens to disappear and goes away and we can go back to a normal life are we going to be able to do that during this school year go back into our normal life and uh where we reposition all of our kids back to their correct schools and have school as it was in September of 2019? I would love to say yes, I really would. Uh, as, as long as we have these health and safety guidelines that we need to follow, we are constricted to what we can do. That doesn't mean that we're not going to continually evaluate how many children are in the buildings and if we can bump up the numbers in certain spots, especially at our 9 through 12 level, I think that's definitely a priority for us. Um, but again, we're, we're kind of uh, in a place where we have to really adhere to these guidelines. I have another question. Sure. Because I think it's going to change the numbers of the class sizes. Okay. But, um, are you going to have a deadline when parents have to say, what model I'm choosing again? So, for sure. So I think that might save some problems if you have to right. lower the class size. Right, right. Um, our plan, our thought process is that tomorrow we are going to send this um, plan out for families to, as a draft to look at because we had um, some participation tonight, but not everybody in our district was on tonight. And so we're hoping to send this out. Uh, we're hoping to get another meeting scheduled with the board to have a vote for the final plan. And then at that point, we're going to send out a questionnaire to families talking about food service, transportation. Um, are you going to be sending your student back? Uh, and then talk about a little bit about the remote. So we're going to have some idea. But um, we're kind of in a holding pattern, as we talked about last week a little bit, until we kind of can move a little bit ahead thinking about this as, as our, our option for the plan. Can we make adjustments to this plan tonight before it gets sent out? Or do you want to, should we just send out this, this proposed draft and make adjustments when we vote on it at the next meeting? Are you, what are you thinking of, Travis? Well, I think that the discussions that I'm hearing a lot tonight is that Wednesday that we're sitting on. And, uh, you know, I don't know if we want to do a straw poll on that, but I'm hearing it not only from the board members, but I also was hearing it from the, the residents as well. And I'm wondering if that Wednesday aspect of taking that day, that half day and getting rid of it and going just to a straight remote learning day is, is our best option. I would rather have that you guys take that back and kind of mull it over with the admin rather than us doing. I don't. I don't feel like. I, I feel like you guys need to kind of revisit that and if if admin decides that no, we really this is the way we really need it, 
um, you know, but hearing the feedback, I think you guys can probably, you know, have that discussion. Well, I have a question about um, KQ5 if you do that, because at this model, they're not taking their devices home, right? K two five, or they are. Uh, but I don't know that we made that dis made any kind of decision about that. I think what we want to do is work with students to get them to bring it home and bring it back, so that's that what I'm saying. Absolutely, so right. we have to move day. to yeah. hybrid. Yeah. They, I mean, if we have to move to remote, that they are able to do that. So we do need to practice that in some way, shape, or form. But we certainly heard a lot of feedback about Wednesday, so we will certainly uh, take that back. We have a meeting tomorrow morning, so we can talk about that at the, at the task force. Um, as I don't really have any sort of proposed tweaks, and I will just say it on surprises didn't come up at all, but the only thing I would love to see is a, an expedited plan for at least six graders to get it back in. I think when we first we're thinking about this, I was sort of envisioning eight through six being more in person. So I, I'd love to see a, a plan that um, just expedites six, maybe seven, but definitely, I feel like they're just that order my age to be home for three days is a lot. So I guess to answer Travis's question, do we, um, how do you, if we're going to get together in a few days to take a vote, will you present us with maybe um, sort of a revised version based on feedback, or that would be that would be the plan that we would go back and we've heard loud and clear about that Wednesday and maybe what we can do about some sort of blend and maybe a skills or something a skills kind of part of the day so, and then the planning part of the day for staff. So we can certainly go back and look at that, and then looking at how you know expediting sixth grade if we, if we can. Do we want to talk now about when that is, or should we? How much time do you guys feel like you need? I I know one. I'm just taking all this in, as we all are. I know that we have been in constant contact with um, high school and consortiums, and we continue to come up with thoughts and ideas, but right now there is, we have yet to figure out a way to maintain this goal and our beliefs and increase the sixth grade or the seventh grade. Um, so it's um, something to once again look through. Everything we've done, we all know, we've got Google checked and looked at everything. Um, and then one more. So again, that lower grade, K to five, what can we do with six? K to six, what can we do with seven? And um, right now, and some great help with high school. I'm confident we have the best minutes we can offer, but we will continue to look at things. I don't know how we can agree it. Yeah, you know, you're running with the shipping, you know, a curious kind of space, but in terms of the availability of classrooms that can really appropriately space the kids, you learn very quickly the limitations of your space. Um, and with 1,717 students coming through this building, we just have some really serious um, constraints. But in terms of our next steps in you know, a scale up model, which is going to be good news, we're reaching the point where we're looking at each other and saying, this is going well, things out there seem like it's going well, who else can we bring in? We're going to be taking a look at prioritizing those that need it most, whether it be you know, the young kiddos or you know, our at risk MP kiddos or the students who need more intervention services through special ed. Um, that's who we're going to target. You know, can we get a whole other grade level in routinely at this point? We're on really tight constraints. We want to still have safety being a priority, along with the K5 being a priority. Um, it's a little bit of give and take. But I do understand that. Sure. But yes, we will consider that feedback. We will consider the Wednesday feedback as well. So as I said, we have a task force meeting tomorrow. So we will, we will be able to talk through some of this. And I'm sure heads are going to be going through tonight. Probably so solving. given that we don't need as much time to schedule a meeting, if it's only one agenda, right. 
So I guess my question is, could we do a remote meeting Thursday to take a vote? Is that too soon? Otherwise, we're kind of bumping it to next week. What's the, that's the only thing that will be on I, well, I then you explain what cheat or whatever. Right, to present it and then right. just the one vote. Okay. I mean, we're meeting tomorrow, so I feel that that's definitely something that we could address. We could address those. So if you guys feel like we want more time, we could do it next week. But if you feel like you want to sort of get a vote and move ahead, no, no I think everyone's yeah. we want to make sure we move past the stage yet. Well, yeah. second and reason. And we already talked about friends and they they are not their part of the day. So we've had some discussions about that. So I feel like we can talk about that again, but that won't be really new in my So we're so online, would it work to have a remote meeting on Thursday just to kind of get the revised proposal and then take a vote? So hold on, let me just clarify something here. Tonight, we want to send out this draft to all of our people to give them, all of our residents, to give them a chance to be able to uh, give us some feedback. If we do that, are we giving them enough time to give us feedback to get the answers or to give questions before Thursday for us to take a vote? I mean, I, I feel like we heard a, a tremendous amount of feedback tonight. Not that there isn't more, but. Um, I think the turnaround is too quick. If they're meeting tomorrow, they're going to send it out. Until so don't, so the you're saying don't, you wouldn't send it out until there was a, a new, a revised. I mean, everybody who was in the feedback for later after we signed on the plan, then the feedback would be when parents, if parents wanted to send their kids to school, if they wanted to do the remote learning. What they were going to, if they were going to send their children to school on the bus. I thought that's what the uh, surveying the parents were looking for. Yeah, I mean, my thought is we, this has been available online and it's recorded, right? So somebody, even if they didn't watch it online, they could watch it tonight, hear the discussion, know that there's some question about the Wednesday, um, know that there's a revised draft coming out. The only problem I have with Wednesday is this, those parents that work. Mm -hmm. they, they'll just, they have to take every Wednesday to have kindergarten or, you know, elementary kids, they're going to have to stay home. We don't have to, anyone's already home. As um, Patty said, we've certainly talked about it, but we will talk about it again. Um, and we will, that was one of our big considerations as well, just keeping that continuity for families. But we can certainly discuss it again, and we can talk about. Um, as Ali mentioned, how to, to look at that sixth grade piece or, or the other identified areas that we feel may need to be targeted, but we can do that. Uh, it's, I mean, it, we are in a holding pattern mm -hmm. a little bit. I, I don't, yeah. I feel like we could do, I feel like we can turn this around by Thursday. Um, and I feel like that gives people a pretty good amount of time to think it all over, even if they don't have the final. It's not going to change dramatically. Right. I mean, I came in tonight expecting to make a vote on this tonight. So I, I think we could pull it off for Thursday. Um, and I, I think you're right. I think we've heard from a lot of the public tonight. Uh, I think we've eased some of their concerns and questions. My concern would be, is, is there any more? And I think if we give them until you know, Thursday evening to make that announcement or to make those questions known, that might be enough time. So, I, I mean, if we, if the administration feels that they can get it, those two questions straightened out by Thursday, then I say we move forward with Thursday because we need to finalize this because yeah. there's a lot of people that are in limbo waiting to hear what, what we're going to do, what we're going to do. So we need to get this done and over with as quickly as possible so everybody can start making their plans. Right. So the administrators that are sitting in the room nodded their heads that yes, we can get it turned over, turned over by Thursday. Okay. All right, seven o'clock. Seven o'clock, and we'll just do remote only Thursday. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Right. Yeah. You guys what? Right. Another hurricane. <laughs> Um, I do want to just give a shout out to Jen for um, coming up with the idea to have people submit their questions and comments and then also sifting through them, but that was um, a really smooth way to get 75 people to be able to weigh in. Thank you, Jen. Are we able to do another YouTube version of this for Thursday, Chris? I don't know if you, I don't know if you can actually answer. Yeah, thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up, Terry. Thumbs up. Good. Thursday, 7 p.m., and we will vote. Okay. All right. So in light, oh, oh dear. So the, that means we are good. We're going to table the proposed change to the calendar. Yes. So does that mean that we actually have two votes on Thursday? Likely. Yes. Does that cause an issue with? It's all the same. I, I see it as the same discussion. Okay. All right. Well, then moving on to uh, employment. Okay. All right. So please have a good evening. <laughs> <laughs> just have a few words on the item. We'll see you tomorrow morning. Thank you. To, um, for the girls who are playing basketball, we have offered it. Send it an offer in good faith for that, and he has accepted that in good faith. Hoping we will have a girl staff right. season. Um, he is familiar with our, our staff, and AJ actually worked with him on some coaching before. He knows um, some of the students that are on the team, and he's excited and is going to reach out to him just to let him know that he's uh, back in on our in our district. He was at Marshwood for a little while and um, in Portsmouth most recently. So that's Jay Kimball. We have a retirement from John Appleby, who's at the high school, uh, English language arts. And um, we received his letter yesterday. And um, he just uh, said, it, due to some stuff going on, that it was time. And he's enjoyed his, his teaching career, his, his career here. And um, he contributed quite a lot to our, our school. So um, that's, that's John Appleby. And then we have a resignation. Um, Lindsay Burrowrich, literacy intervention, well, a literacy coach at Husey School. Um, and she submitted that this morning. And primarily, she has young children at home, and uh, their schedule is vastly different uh, than what, what was going to come down. And she needs to uh, have a resignation for that. And then we have a leave of absence, and we have to vote on that. So I believe that that's going to be done at a, right now. Um, if that's okay. So Kristen Bennett, who is one of the counselors at Leba in Lebanon, um, we put her, she w went part time. She was going to be part time for the fall, uh, but we did receive um, a request for a leave of absence for this upcoming year for family reasons. She's got um, different children at different grade levels. She's got a very young, young child. She just had a child. And so she's asking for a leave of absence for the school year. So I think we need a, a vote on that one. I'll make a motion to accept that leave of absence, Travis. I'll second it. Okay. All right. Um, can I ask a question? Yes. Is it does the leave of absence because she has three different schools? Is that gonna is that gonna trigger more teachers to say she did not say it's because she has children in other schools. She just said her family and her youngster. That's kind of where she was focusing. Um, so do we want to do, uh, we'll do a roll call. Um, Linda Corliss? Yes. Travis Doran? Yes. Stephanie Hagenboat? Yes. Was Rebecca Walker on? Mine's on. Rebecca? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, Lynn Van Lee? Yes. Nancy Newbert? Yes. Joanne Potter? Yes. Teresa Schaefer? Yes. And Denise Mallet, yes. Okay, and then the retirement and the resignation. I was say, we have to make a motion on those, don't we? Yes. So um, I'll make a motion yes. to accept um, the retirement for Mr. Appleby. I'll second. 
Can we do the retirement resignation together, or do we have to? I think you have to do it separately. Okay. Yes, you do. Um, Yes. Okay. Um, Linda Corliss? Yes. Travis Dwyer? Yes. Stephanie Hagemuth? Yes. Rebecca Hopper? Yes. Rebecca? Yes. Nancy Newberg? Yes. Joanne Potter? Yes. Estrella Schaefer? Yes. And Denise Mallet, yes. Okay, and then we have the Borough Bridge resignation. Um, this is the street. I'll make the motion to accept. This is Travis, and I'll second. Um, I will just say with regret because she was one of my son's absolute favorite teachers. So, sad to see her go. Yes. Um, Linda Corliss? Yes. Travis Lauren? Yes. Stephanie Hagenbuth? Yes. Ben Manley? Yes. Nancy Newbert? Yes. Joanne Potter? Yes. Estrella Schaefer? Yes. And Denise Mallet? Yes. Really good at doing this task. I've got it all written out, and I'm there. It's just Stephanie's last name that I feel uh, <laughs> that I'm worried I'm not getting right. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Um, do we have any other? That was it. And that was it for public input. So can we get well, well, hold on. Don't we have to take a vote to do a meeting on Thursday? Because it's so no so short. Isn't that what you sent out this, this afternoon, Audra? I think she said it was big, we could do it shorter because it was only one item, agenda item. I don't think you have to have a motion to do that. I think we just need to call it an emergency meeting. Okay. All right. So I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll second. All right. Thank you.